There we go. Good morning, everyone. I was on mute. Uh, welcome to our webinar on the Milestone One Proof of Concept process, where we create your project process, process flow using our build, test, and refine method. I'm Will Whitney. I'll be your presenter today. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, something to help me out would be in your control panel, there's a little hand icon. If you could hit the hand so I know that you can see me and hear me, that would be fantastic. Okay, I see a couple going up, which means it is working. Um, that's great. Also in that control panel, there's a section called questions. So as I go along here, if you have any questions, go ahead and write them there. I may not get to them until the end of the webinar, but I will take a look at that question box and answer um, any that I see. Okay. So what we're going to do here is I'll start. We'll go through the webinar and hope you enjoy it. So let me close a few panels here, the hidden panels. Okay. So the purpose for this webinar is it's about you. Yes, it's about our milestone process, but really the whole reason we do the milestone process is, is that so your digital conversion project is a success. We want you to have a warm and fuzzy feeling going forward with a digital conversion project if you decide to work with us. And that's something that we've learned really does help uh, our clients is this M1, this milestone one. And we want you to know what to expect if you work with us. We don't want you to, let's say, sign a contract and then it just turns into a black hole of, I don't know what's going on, what the am I doing, what happens. This milestone process is part of our, um, our work with our clients. So what is a milestone one? It's basically the setup, creation, and initial testing of your project process flow before we get into the meat of your digital conversion project. Uh, we just call it M1 for short internally, but the official name is a milestone one. And it really was created, you could call it by mistake, but out of necessity, we uh, had an issue with a project a number of years ago. I've been in the company for about eight years, and this was decently before my time, but basically we were doing a microfilm conversion project, I think it was 2,000 rolls or so, and back in the day we didn't have an M1, and we, we ran the project based off the scope of work and a contract and everything that goes into these digital conversion projects, and when we delivered the project to the client, they were okay with it, but they said this isn't really what we thought we were getting and what we, we kind of signed up for. At the end of the day, we went back and rescanned all 2,000 rolls, which is no, no simple feat. And after that, we said there's got to be a better way. So a couple smart folks in the back said, let's do this proof of concept idea to make sure that we're doing the right thing. So that's what the milestone is for. It's to ensure that we don't deliver something that you don't want and just to help us build the project uh, consistent with your scope of work and what you believe you're going to get from it. So there are three phases to an M1. This bill, uh, give me one second here. Uh, I was just told, my mistake, my slides are not showing. That is a mistake on me. So let me share that real quick. Ah, now you can see it. I'm glad I have a, a helper for this. So here's the title slide. That's me. I went through the different purposes. Sorry I skipped this. I was a little ahead of myself there. But here's where we are. Back to it. The build, test, refine method. Uh, basically, we have three phases to an M1, and that is build, test, and refine. I'll go into each of those in detail. Um, and it's a step-by-step -step approach to make sure we make the project right for you. So first is the build phase. And that is where we are we're creating the process flow. And what is a process flow? It's basically a step-by-step -step method by which we're going to complete your project. And it can be anywhere from 10 steps to 50 plus steps. It just depends on your project, but it is going to be every step of the way for your project to be successful. The project management team, we do have a number of folks that work in project management. Uh, there is one particular individual, uh, our senior project manager, that's kind of the M1 architect. She handles most of them, although um, our, 
all the project teams involved in the M1. She designs most of them just because of her experience and skills in this, but the project management team as a whole creates your unique process flow. And it is unique to you. Although we do have, I mean, we've done tens of thousands of, of projects, although there are a lot that are similar, every process flow is unique to every project and every client. Because you may have similar material to someone else, you may have a similar goal of another agency that we've already worked with, but there's always something unique about each of our clients, so we do have to build and test that process flow to make sure it fits your uh, specifications. This step is one of the most time consuming uh, because we're really building from scratch. As I mentioned, there can be templates or experiences with other clients, other projects that we've done, but there's always something about every project that is unique to that, that client and that material, and it is time consuming building something to make sure that it's gonna work later on. So this, this can be uh, a, the relatively slower part of a project once you work with us. Usually, uh, the build phase, the, the M1 as a whole, is usually about three to four weeks long. It can be shorter if you need it to be quicker. Sometimes it can be longer if it's really complex, but it's about three to four weeks long just because we're starting from scratch. We're, we're making a new process flow for you. Now, creating your M1, it's using the project scope of work that was created uh, by you and your sales rep, rep as the bones of the, the process flow. So with any of our projects, a sales rep will work with uh, our client, or if you decide to work with us, you'll work with one of our sales reps, and you'll create a scope of work, which is basically a description of what your project is going to be and what we're going to do to get you to the end result. Then you have all the contracting and admin. But that scope of work is going to be the basis for the process flow and the M1. All aspects of that scope of work will be incorporated in the process flow from beginning to end. So getting the material, uh, doing the scanning, doing the indexing, delivery, uh, digital file format methods, all those are going to be incorporated into the scope of work and the process flow. And when we're talking about digital conversion projects, uh, it could be you could have paper going to digital, you could have microfilm going to digital. We can also do... Uh, digital images to microfilm. Some of our customers still uh, receive that from us. It could be a digital to digital conversion project. Any one of those can have an M1. It's not a specific type of project. It's just any project will have an M1 uh, tied to it. Now the process flow as a whole lives throughout the entirety of the project. The process flow exists the entire time we're running your project. The M1 is really the beginning part. That first I don't know, call it 10, 15%, that building and getting the whole process flow ready so that it can exist throughout the project. And an analogy I like to use is you're ordering food at a restaurant. So I'll, I'll walk through the steps of how, how it's an analogy, and I think it might make a little more sense. I hope it's, you're not hungry over where I am. It's 10 o'clock, but it might be lunchtime for a few of you folks. And it's also going to be looking at some beautiful steak. So... Let's say you go to a restaurant and you say, I know what I want. I want a steak. That's the project. That's the end result. You know what you're looking for. You have an idea, so you're going to order a steak. Now, what do you do when you get a steak? Well, you want to be kind to the, the chef, so you're going to taste it first before doing anything crazy with it. So you can take a bite. Now, does it need salt? Does it need a little A1? Do, do the French fries need some pepper? You're going to take a bite, think about it. Go, All right, I think this needs a little bit of salt. So you tweak the dish, you, you add some salt to your steak and your meal, and then you think, okay, you test it again, you take another bite, this is perfect, and then you start eating. Let's say it's, it's dinner. You're eating your dinner and you think, this is great. I tested it, I changed it up a bit to fit, fit more of what I wanted, and now I'm happy. So eating the meal, that's like the process flow. You're eating from the beginning of the meal, meal to the end. So you're always eating throughout. That's like the process flow. It lives throughout the entire project. The testing and the seasoning is like the M1. That's happening early. An important part, uh, note about that is you might season the steak at the very beginning of the meal, but then throughout you might continue tweaking it as you go along. But probably the big majority of your, your uh, adjusting of the meal is at the beginning. That's like the M1. You're going to do most of the tweaking, adjusting, testing, retrying at the beginning of the project 
It's not to say you can't change something later on or something might happen that requires you to adjust what you're doing, but the majority of that is going to be at the beginning of the project. So creating your M1, the tools of the trade. So these are the tools that we use to create your M1. This is the login to our Unity system. Um, I'll show you a few more slides within Unity, but this is the login where everything happens from uh, the beginning of the project to the end. And it's something that our in-house software development staff created because we used to use uh, various applications for job tracking and project creation and whatnot. And we, over the years, we thought we can build our own. They'll do what we really want to do. So I think it was about three or four years ago, they developed the Unity system, maybe longer. But they created this to track jobs and track projects in a more meticulous manner. They also uh, rolled up our, um, what do you call it, our, our job creation system, basically the handoff from sales to project management. We used to call it SOP. That was also rolled into Unity. So it's becoming a unified system where everything's internal to our own platform. And this is what that SOP is. And SOP originally stood for scope of project, which was a, uh, it's basically taking the scope of work that the sales rep and you work on to create that, that contract and turning it into something that the project management team can use to create the process flow. So what you're looking at here is inside Unity in the, let's see, in the uh, SOP application. And this is actually a real project. It's actually one of mine. It's one of my smaller ones. Uh, and it's a good example here. I'm just moving my camera screen out of the way so I can see a little better. So what I did here is I took the scope of work that I worked on with my client, and I translated that into multiple service lines, these SLs, so that our project team knew what I wanted to happen and what the customer wanted to get. So we use Salesforce for our, our sales tracking, our opportunity tracking. So we have that in here, which links to an approved opportunity. Then we have a material security classification. This was private material. It wasn't sensitive like HIPAA or uh, criminal information or anything like that, but it was private to our customers. So we marked as private. Things like newspapers or something of that sort might be level one, which is just public information. It's, it doesn't require certain levels of uh, security, but once you get to level two and higher, Certain things have to happen internally here. Milestone one information. So I'm putting in my service line that when the M1 is ready for approval, I want to see it because I'm going to review it with my customer, and that's what I did. So if I clicked view, you'd actually see notes about each service line and what I want to happen specifically, but this is just a high level view. We were doing microfiche scanning, so I described what we're doing, the price for the project. Uh, we made PDFs out of the fiche, some indexing information. We delivered it on an encrypted USB thumb drive, and then there's some shipping information down here. So basically, start to finish, I laid out, here's what the project did, here's what the contract says we're agreeing to and what we're going to do, and I'm pushing this forward so our project team can take this and make a process flow. Now this is an actual chart. The chart itself is a real project. It was, um, I think we were doing about 1,800 or so rolls of microfilm. We changed the name so it doesn't have any of our actual clients here, but the process flow is a real process flow. So when we're building that, it, in this Unity system, it presents it in ways like this and makes it very easy for our project managers to see your project and where it is uh, throughout the duration of the M1 as well as the project as a whole. So. These units over here describe how many units uh, each phase encompasses. And the, the, the bars here actually mean different things. So green is you have about 800 rolls that green means good, everything's going fine, they keep moving along the steps. Purple, red, and yellow mean things like uh, there's an exception, there's an error, something that the project manager needs to look at to check on. So something's stalling in our process flow and we need to check on it. The cool thing is, that we can tra track every single unit of your project throughout the duration of the project. So I'm not going to go into the heavy details, but I could click on, let's say, this bar. If I clicked on that, it would show me every single role to the individual unit that is in this process flow for configuring a role XML for uh, blips. 
I could see every individual role by identification number if I click that. Same with the exception. So it's, it's very nice for us to be able to track every unit of your project. It's good for our customers too when they're asking, hey, where am I? What's going on? Are there any issues? We can, we can point to that and say, here's where we are. Here's how much we've done. Here's some problems. Here's some things we're fixing and so on. So that SOP allows the project team to create a process flow like this. Now, once the process flow is created, the next step is, the next phase is the test phase, and that's the sample batch testing. So what we're doing during the test is taking a small portion of your overall project and running it through that newly created process flow to see what happens. The goal is basically to make sure that all the steps we're implementing, A, are necessary, B, they work as we expect them to work and want them to work, and C, it allows us to deliver the results you're asking for. So when we run the test, it's not like we're kind of hand jamming it and doing something different than what's going to happen during the project as a, as a whole. We're actually using the real process flow that the, the the, the main project, the holistic project, will use, but just with a small portion of material. Phase three is the refine phase where we go through the review and approval. So once we've tested your material, we get to the refine phase with the point of resolving any errors that we found during the build and test phases. Now, errors has a couple different meanings here. It could be a step in the process flow we've created that needs to be adjusted or maybe added or removed. So we create a process flow, let's say it's 25 steps long, and we run the test through, maybe we realize, okay, we don't need all those steps. We can actually remove these two steps here, and now we have a 23-step process flow. That can happen. Maybe we think, okay, we missed something. We need to add another step, or we need to adjust something that's happening during the process flow. An error can be something that we found related to your material that doesn't actually fit the scope of work. This is not uncommon where let's assume you have 500 boxes of records and you're working with a sales rep. Let's say they visited you. You took a, took a look at a few boxes and it's all, uh, you know, it's all uh, just records in manila folders. And the project at a high level is you want to scan the files index them by the, the folder label, and import them to your system. Okay, great. So we, we plan for that. We build a process flow around that idea. Then when we actually get the, the test batch and we start processing it, maybe something like, an, like a bound book shows up in one of the test boxes. That's something that would be out of the scope of work that we've created and it was agreed to that we'll need to adjust for. So it gives us the chance, this refine phase, it gives us the chance to basically inform you of anything we found that might be an issue or maybe a way to make your project better. That's another thing that's fairly common is not that our clients have the wrong idea of what they want. It's just that it's very hard to figure out every little thing that's going to go into a digital conversion project. And many times as we're doing testing and process flow creation and refining, we might find a better way based on other projects we've done and our experiences of doing something with your material that might be a little better or at least is it another option for you to consider. It also gives you the chance to see what your final product will look like, which going back to that thing I mentioned earlier about how we did an entire 2,000 role project and then had to redo it, trying to avoid that, it gives you the chance to see what you're going to get and approve what we're going to do. And a key point of the M1, if there's no approval, no soup for you, you and BMI. We do not move forward without an approval on an M1. Because if we did that, we may run into the same situation where we think we're doing the right thing and there's just a miscommunication and then there's got to be rework or maybe then it becomes you know, back and forth of, well, were you supposed to do that? Yes, it says it here on paper, but we didn't agree to it. All that we're trying to eliminate by having this approval. So without an approval, we have, I think right now we have in our M1, um, our M1 tracking, we have maybe 15 projects or so that are in waiting for customer approval. And those projects will not start. Our project team will not do those until our sales rep works with their customers to get approval on the M1. 
So avoiding that whole misstep of doing the wrong thing, you not getting what you want, that approval is critical. I'm using the word critical again here. It's critical to not just yours, not just BMI's, but our combined success. Because you get a dedicated process flow to basically complete your project. The records are processed through the M1 to ensure that uh, what we're doing is right and it's compatible with what we're building. So we get that testing, we make sure the material we're actually gonna be scanning and processing does work with the process flow we created. You can see the final result, and we have the opportunity to expose any of those irregularities or just things we find during that testing. And then, as I mentioned, a lot of times we illuminate better ways to go forward with the project that you can do or not do. It's just usually recommendations. Um, yeah, that's all. Okay. Now, an M1 example. So we'll walk through an example here. And I mentioned before that we, an M1 can go, or a process flow can work with any type of project. So it could be paper to digital, microfilm to digital, microfiche, aperture cards. You could go digital to hard copy by us creating microfilm. You can go legacy migration, so digital, digital. Many different things to do. What I'm gonna use for this example is going to be a microfilm uh, conversion project. Just for simplicity. So. The scope of work, I'll, I'll set up the scenario with the original scope of work, very simplified. So let's say you have 1,500 rolls of microfilm and you work at a, a police department. So you, they're, they're criminal reports. So that would be in our system a level three project and it would be actually a CGIS, Criminal Justice Information Services project, specifically for criminal information. So that sets up the SOP and the project just based on the security level. 1,500 roles. Let's say you're going to scan to Digital Reel, which is our hosted application. That's going to go into the process flow. Right now, you think, I'm just going to index by the role label. So the box that holds the microfilm role, you're just going to call it by that. That's where you want it to be digitally named. And we're going to apply OCR, so you have text search of, of your record. And then we're also going to export PDFs from our Digital Reel system so that you have a backup copy. So let's say you have 1,500 of these, these cartridges. Uh, steps for the project are gonna be, you know, just a few of them here. We're gonna have to prep the rolls, scan the rolls, import the digital reel, index the files, crop the images, deliver the export images, return your microfilm, all that goes into the process flow. So the first phase is the build phase. So first step, sales rep will use Unity to enter the project order, that SOP I showed you earlier then the project team is gonna review the SOP and assign uh, the project manager for the duration of the project. Now, the reviewing the SOP is critical because not only does the sales rep create the work order, but every Wednesday, our project team, which includes our VP of software, our plant manager for Sunnyvale, our plant manager for Sacramento, and that senior architect project manager that I mentioned earlier, they review every SOP that's approved uh, in the system at this meeting to see if what they need is in that SOP. If it's not, they let the sales rep know that the SOP cannot go forward to project, uh, process flow creation because there's information missing. So there are multiple steps to make sure we're building the right project. So they review the SOPs and assign a project manager. And then the project manager will start building that process flow. And the actual process flow, see so at the high level, kind of, yeah, here's what's happening for the project. The individual steps like that chart I was showing you would be photographing the role label. We apply UID barcodes. UID means unique identifier. So every unit that comes into our facilities for us to work on gets a unique ID number. So if this is 1,500 rolls of microfilm, there will be 1,500 unique units. If you were giving us 200 boxes of records, we would tag each box. We'd know that there are 200 boxes tracked throughout the entire process. Uh, microfilm gets density and quality checks, then we scan the rolls, we index the, the field by keying from the roll photo, framing images, creating XMLs, OCR processing, and then loading to the system. Those are some of the steps involved that will go into that chart that we looked at earlier. 
then we've built it. Now we're going to test the pro uh, process flow. So for this project of about 1,500 rolls, we might do about five to 10 rolls as the um, as the test batch. So it's not a set in stone number of how many units we use as a test batch. It just depends on the project. So that would be a normal normal batch for testing based on that volume of, of material. The key thing, though, is are we getting a good cross-section of your project? And what I mean by that is if you have, let's say we're still using these 1,500 rolls, but we're working with not just criminal files. Let's say the department wants to give us their HR, our HR files that are on microfilm. They want to give us their finance stuff. They want to give us their employee files. Whatever it is, the more document types you have, basically variations of the material and what's on it, we want to make sure we get some sample records uh, to identify those during the process flow and make sure we're seeing a good cross-section of the entire project. We don't want to just see one document type when there really are 10. We'd want to see one roll from each of those 10 document types, you know, one or two rolls. So that's a critical piece. It's not the number of rolls. It's really are we seeing the project as a whole and what we're going to get when we get the remainder of the material. Because we want to set up the process flow to accommodate each type, basically. Then we run each role through the entire process flow from step one to step whatever, you know, step 30. Now let's say we're doing that and boom, this pops up. We say, okay, this is a little different than what we thought. So let's assume that, so we're in California. Let's say that one of our, the, the client we're working with is in uh, Texas and we weren't able to go see them and check out their material. We never were able to get a sample role, but they still wanted to work with us. And the first time we see the physical material, is the M1. So this pops up, we go, what's this, while we're scanning? Well, that is actually blipped microfilm. So what we talked about earlier was that we're gonna do roll level indexing. You have 1,500 rolls, you're gonna have 1,500 index points. It's just basically the, the beginning of the roll will identify, here's roll one through 1,500. Well, these blips are little things that allow you to actually pinpoint different records on the roll. So these are, this is a double level blipped film you have a fat blip, which indicates the beginning of a record, and then the single blips uh, identify documents which, within that file. So then here's the first document right here, and the second one that's within the file, within, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Oh, here's a new file because it's a double-level blip. So we notice that during the test. That gives us an idea that when we get to the refine stage, I'll point out that, that new plan that might happen. So test is complete. Now you have the roles available in that system. You can access them. You have some cropped images to look at based on the test. The sales reps reviewing the M1 with you, showing you what we've done, making sure the indexing right is right. You agree that the image quality is fine, the indexing is accurate, everything looks great based on the scope of work, the original document, the, you know, the contract that said, here's what I want you to do. No issues and you're ready to go. But then the sales rep says, you know, you do have this blipped film, and we might be able to index to the case level instead of the role level. Let's say there are 100 cases on each role. Instead of having one role and then scrolling through and trying to find a case, we can just go straight to the individual case. So you just type in the number, and you go straight to it. Maybe little or no increase in price, depending on how we can do this. And then you mentioned, oh, yeah, we actually have an index that does tell us where each case is on each role, which for some reason this was never mentioned before. Great. We take that, we incorporate it into the M1, the M1's updated, the process flow is updated, so now you have that new indexing scheme, and you can go straight to a case. We redo the M1 or the test, we review it with you again, and you go, this is perfect, project is a go, and then we start getting the rest of the material, the rest of the roles, and scanning, and then complete the project. That's a, a simple example of an M1, but that's what would happen, and that's the benefit of the M1 is, Either A, you could have approved the project as it existed, or what we did here is you go, oh, I didn't know I could do that. Great, let's tweak the process flow in the project and go down that new path that makes it easier for, for you in the end by going straight to a file instead of just scrolling around on a roll. So that's the, the, the glory of the M1 and why we like to do this, because it benefits you and us and makes the project just a better project. So that's a quick example of, a, of an M1. And where we are now is, basically the questions that you have. So I'll see if anyone has any uh, questions here about the M1 process. Let me pop.
pop this out here. Okay, so I don't see any questions from uh, any of the attendees. So I will quickly just give you a couple questions that we do get a lot in case you just you know you don't feel like asking them. How long does an M1 take? I did mention it before, but it is critical to mention again that it's about three to four weeks in general. Something that um, you know we want you to know that because we do have to get your material to us, and we don't want you to think that as soon as the material arrives, we're working on it. That can happen for certain projects if there's an expedited reason, but most of the time it gets here, we gotta put the order in, we have to review the SOP, like the project management team I mentioned, and it's gonna be three to four weeks based on the complexity of the project and what has to happen. Could be shorter, could be longer, that's a, a good timeline. Uh, is an M1 required? is another question, and the answer is actually no. We don't necessarily have a, a formal M1 every project. Some projects like the one I mentioned before, uh, the one I showed you that was my small project, that, it was kind of an internal M1. So I did say, tell my project team to give me the material to review it, but I didn't, it wasn't a formal, let's get the complete approval through the normal channels. I worked with my point of contact and just had her work with me and, and she told me it was approved and then I pushed forward with my project team. So it was still M1 of a sort, but it wasn't the full-blown, okay, this is a massive project. This is, you know, we have to get the, the full-blown email chain from directly from the customer type of thing. This was a little bit more informal. Um, it wasn't necessarily required because it's a very simple project, but I wanted to do it anyway just to make sure that my, my customer was getting what they wanted. And what happens if I ask for changes? So the M1 is not really set in stone for eternity. It can change. A key point is that we are building the process flow based on what was agreed to in the scope of work and contract. So depending on the change, it may be a no charge thing. There may be a out of scope, this is a bigger change than it's just a simple tweak. And we may have to adjust pricing based on that. It really depends on the project. That's not that's not something that I can say, we're guaranteeing going to change the price if you change the M1 or the process flow, because that's not the case. It depends on the change and what has to happen. So yes, you can change stuff. We want you to get what you want at the end. We want you to get the right end result uh, product. So it's critical, if you want something changed, you let us know. So we don't want to give you something that you're unhappy with. Okay, so let me just double check here. Ah. I have a question, are most of the documents you work with typewritten? No, we see a lot of stuff. Um, some are computer generated um, printouts or maybe microfilm or microfiche has originally uh, made some computer printouts that were then microfilmed. Uh, for paper files, we can see, we see handwriting, we see typed, we see computer printed, all variations. Um, the actual digitization, like the scanning to a digital image, that doesn't really, the, the typewritten versus handwritten, whatever, that doesn't come into effect. It will affect potentially the OCR text search. Doesn't work too well on handwriting. Okay on some typewritten material. Usually pretty good on um, computer printouts. But it's never 100% guaranteed because you could have two pieces of paper that are the same document. OCR process both and one will be better than the other. It just depends on the actual quality of the material. So you could have great computer printed uh, a great you know, computer printed document, but if there are coffee stains all over it or someone crumbled it up and spilled it, ripped it, whatever, it could have terrible OCR. So it's really the condition of the material is a big effect, not just the type versus handwritten versus printed. Do you work with documents that are positive, as in white paper, black ink, and negative black paper, white ink? Yes, we work with both, um, mostly in the microfilm and microfiche uh, realm. Uh, we we can do either. The polarity does not affect us. It just may affect um, the the end result. Usually, the original negatives are better than the positives, just because it's an original document. The more generations you go away from an original, the quality usually goes down a, you know, a click or two. But we work with both. Okay, that was the last one I saw. So I'll move on. So. You can contact me. Um, I'd be happy to chat with you anytime. Here are the, the different ways you can get to me. Uh, there's my direct email, my direct phone number, and
And if you want to just do like a web chat, um, you can either add, just go to our website and click the little chat button, or if you just type that drift.me slash wwhitney into your URL, it'll pop up a little thing that you can start chatting with me directly um, as long as I'm online, which is most of the business day. So that's how to contact me personally. And then if you want to take a look at our website, there's, there it is there, bmiimage.com. We also have a LinkedIn that you can access. And we do have a YouTube channel called the Digital Imaging Channel where we post videos uh, about once a month. The, uh, we just recorded the M1 process video a couple weeks ago, and that's going to be posted next week. But there are other, other videos as well covering various topics about microfilm scanning, general document conversion, a bunch of different to topics coming up. But about once a month we post a video, so if you want to see those and get more information, Go ahead and subscribe to our channel or just check on it every now and then and you'll see uh, what we're posting. So that's all I have today. Thank you folks for joining. And again, contact me with any questions you have or if you have a project, I'd be happy to chat with you. I may not be the person to actually work with you on the project. I do lean towards more of the marketing operations side. We have some great sales reps that any one of them could be uh, a good fit for your project. But let me know and we'll uh, connect you with one of them. But that's all I have, and thanks for joining.